Welcome to this deep dive. Today, we're uh, taking a closer look at Immunity Bio. They're a company really focused on innovative immunotherapies, targeting both cancers and, interestingly, infectious diseases, too. Mm -hmm. And what really catches the eye is their, well, what they call their triangle offense strategy. It's quite unique. Right, the triangle offense. We'll definitely get into that. It seems to be about hitting the immune system from, like, multiple angles. Exactly. Instead of just focusing on one specific immune pathway, which a lot of therapies do, they're aiming for a, well, a more comprehensive immune activation. Okay. And for context, uh, they merged with NatQuest, didn't they, back in December 2020? That's right. That merger really brought together a lot of different tech capabilities under one roof. They're headquartered out in San Diego, California. And market cap wise, they're sitting around, what, $2.37 billion currently. But the real star of the show today, I think, has to be NK Tiva. Oh, absolutely. NK Tiva or Nogapendikin Alpha in Bacchusep PMLN, if you want the full name. Light chuckle. Let's stick with NK Tiva. Good call. It's their flagship product. And it really embodies that whole multi-pronged immunotherapy idea. It's uh, pretty central to their story right now. Yeah, and actually we had a listener from the Stock Explorers community ask specifically about this. They wanted us to, you know, explain Annie K. Taiva, dig into the future revenue potential for Immunity Bio's whole pipeline, and also look at their financing situation, how they're funding things until they hopefully reach profitability. Okay, great questions. So to that listener and everyone else joining us from Stock Explorers, welcome. This deep dive is for you. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. Sounds good. So let's unpack that triangle offense first. Essentially, it's about hitting three key parts of the immune system all at once. Okay. What are the three points of the triangle? First, you've got the natural killer cells, or NK cells. Think of them as the uh, innate immune system's first responders. Fast acting. Got it. NK cells. Second, T cells. These are part of the adaptive immune response, more targeted, learn to recognize specific threats. Right. The adaptive side. And third, crucially, memory T cells. These guys stick around long term providing surveillance to, you know, hopefully prevent the cancer from coming back, durability. So it's not just about activating an immune response. It's about activating these specific types of cells, NKT and memory T together. Precisely. It's a coordinated effort. The thinking is this multi-pronged attack might work better than some uh, conventional immunotherapies that often focus on just one pathway, like checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah. Checkpoint inhibitors have been amazing, but they don't work for everyone, right? especially in solid tumors. Exactly. A significant number of patients don't respond, unfortunately. So this triangle offense um, offers a potential alternative strategy to get a more robust and hopefully more lasting anti-cancer effect. Interesting. And they've built up quite a toolkit to make this happen, haven't they? Different technology platforms. They have. They've got things like antibody cytokine fusion proteins, their own activated natural killer cell platform, and even CRNK cell therapies. It's quite broad. Wow. Okay. Lots going on there. But let's zoom back in on Anketiva. You said it's an IL-15 receptor agonist. Yes, a novel IL-15 receptor agonist. Okay. And the big news, of course, was the FDA approval last year, 2024. Right, for that specific type of bladder cancer? Correct, for BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, NMIBC, with carcinoma in situ, or CIS. That's known to be a really tough-to-treat group of patients, isn't it? So that approval was a major milestone for them. Huge. Absolutely huge. So how does NKT work on a cellular level? What's the mechanism? Okay, so it works by directly stimulating two key cell types we mentioned, CD8 plus T cells and natural killer cells. It does this by binding to a specific receptor on these cells. Activating the killers, essentially. Pretty much. But it also, very importantly, leads to the creation of those memory T cells we talked about. That's key for the potential long-term protection. And it does this without boosting the bad guys, like the regulatory T cells that can sometimes dampen the immune response. That's a key part of the design, yes. Yeah. It aims to stimulate the cancer-fighting cells without significantly activating those regulatory T cells. Yeah. So it's a more selective amplification, if you will. That sounds pretty elegant, actually. And the clinical trial data backed this up. It did, yeah. The results were frankly, quite impressive. They showed really durable, complete responses in those BCG unresponsive NMIBC patients. Some patients maintained these responses for uh, over 47 months. Wow, over 47 months is this it's remarkable durability. It really is. And importantly, it also showed a favorable safety profile, which is always critical. No kidding. And commercially, it seems like it's starting to gain some traction, especially since getting that permanent J-code. Absolutely. That J-code, J9028, which they got in January 2025, that really streamlined the reimbursement process. And since then, 
uptake has been strong. How strong are we talking? Well, in Q1 of 2025, their unit sales volume jumped uh, 150% over the previous quarter, Q4 2024. 150% quarter over quarter. Yep. And their estimated net product revenue hit about $16.5 million in Q125, which was up 129% from the prior quarter. Interestingly, the units they sold just in Q1 actually beat the total units sold in all of Q4 2024. Okay, those are definitely signs of a strong launch. Yeah. So Aaron K. Tiva in bladder cancer seems to be off to a really good start. But what about the rest of the pipeline? Where else could this drug or their approach make a difference? Right, this is where the uh, future revenue potential story gets really interesting. They're not just stopping with that initial NMIBC approval. Makes sense. Expand within bladder cancer first. Exactly. They submitted a supplemental BLA and SBLA in Q1 2025. This is for NMIBC, but with papillary disease. If that gets approved, maybe late 2025, early 2026, it opens up Anakativa to a significantly larger group of bladder cancer patients. Okay, logical step. What about outside of bladder cancer? Lung cancer is always a huge market. Definitely. Non-small cell lung cancer, NSCLC. They're running a phase three trial. It's called resq 201 a This one's in collaboration with Beijing. Ah, yes, the Beijing collab. What's the focus there? It's specifically for patients whose NSCLC has progressed after they've already been treated with checkpoint inhibitors. So another area of high unmet need. And they're hoping for approval soon. They're planning to submit the BLA later this year, 2025. And there's potential for an accelerated approval maybe late this year or sometime in 2026. Okay, NSCLC. That market is just massive, isn't it? What kind of potential revenue are we talking about if they get approval there? It's huge. The global NSCLC market could hit something like $66 billion by 2033. The U.S. slice alone is estimated maybe around $16, $17 billion by then. Wow. So, look, if Annex Siva manages to capture even a you know, modest share, especially in that post-checkpoint inhibitor setting initially, you could potentially be looking at uh, maybe low hundreds of millions in annual revenue just in the U.S. to start. And globally even more. Potentially, yeah. Maybe yeah. exceeding half a billion globally over time, even with a fairly small market share. It's a significant opportunity. Okay, that's definitely one to watch. I also heard something about using Ampetiva for lymphopenia, low lymphocyte counts. Yes, that's another interesting angle. Lymphopenia is common in cancer patients, often due to treatment. Ankitiva got an RMAT designation that's Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy from the FDA for this. RM it too. Okay, so that speeds things up potentially. It can help, yeah. They submitted an expanded access protocol based on that. Formal approval might come maybe 2026 or later. Mm -hmm. But think about it as a supportive therapy for lots of cancer patients. That's a potentially large market. So potentially another revenue stream in the hundreds of millions range. It's certainly possible, yeah. Again, yeah. depends on adoption or pricing, but the patient pool is large. They seem to be targeting really difficult areas. What about pancreatic cancer? That's notoriously tough. It is. And yes, they're going after that too. NKTTVA also received RMAT designation for pancreatic cancer, specifically for patients with multiply relapse, locally advanced, or metastatic disease. Another RMAT. When might we see a filing there? Well, that depends on their pivotal trial, Quilty 88. Mm -hmm. If the results are positive, a BLA submission might be possible in, say, 2026 or 2027. Again, high unmet needs. So success there could mean, you guessed it, potentially hundreds of millions more in annual revenue. It's quite a list. I even saw something about cancer prevention, Lynch syndrome. Ah, yes. That's more of a longer term play, I'd say. It's an early stage trial. But yeah, they're looking at using their approach to potentially prevent colon cancer in people with Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic condition increasing cancer risk. Fascinating idea, but probably further out. Oh, definitely. Approval, if it happens, probably wouldn't be before 2027, maybe 2028. But if it works, a first-in-class immunoprevention therapy, that would be huge down the line. And quickly, they also have that recombinant BCG program, right, to help with the shortage? That's correct. There's been an ongoing shortage of BCG, the standard bladder cancer therapy. Immunity Bio developed a recombinant version, RBCG, and they have an expanded access program running at about 60 sites. So that could help patients now and maybe position them to grab some market share later. Exactly. Two birds with one stone, potentially. Okay, so adding all this up, the current approval, the potential expansions in bladder, lung, pancreatic cancer, lymphopenia, maybe even prevention. What are analysts saying about future sales? Well, projections vary, obviously, but they're generally pretty bullish. H.C. Wainwright, for example, has projected NKTIVA sales 
hitting maybe $137 million or so in 2025. Okay, based on the current trajectory. Right. And looking further out, they see it potentially reaching, uh, get this, $4.3 billion by 2034, assuming success in these other major indications. $4.3 billion. That's ambitious. It's very ambitious, yes. Mm -hmm. But it gives you an idea of the perceived scale if multiple pipeline programs hit. Overall, the consensus forecasts point towards really rapid revenue growth, maybe in the uh, 46, 48 percent per year range for the next few years. OK, that paints a very rosy picture on the revenue side. But uh, drug development and commercialization costs a fortune. What's their actual financial health like right now? That's the critical flip side, isn't it? Mm. So market cap around two point three seven billion dollars, as we said. Revenue trailing 12 months was about fourteen point seven five million dollars. Growing fast, yes, but still small relative to the valuation and the burn rate. And low loss. And losses were still substantial, around $413 million, though that was an improvement from the year before. Yeah. Q125 net product revenue was estimated at $16.5 million, which is good progress. But the free cash flow is the big number. Negative, I assume. Oh, yeah. Negative $398 million over the last 12 months reported. That's a significant cash burn. Yikes. Okay, so what did their cash balance look like recently? How much runway did they have? Well, as of the end of last year, December 31st, 2024, they reported having about $149.8 million in cash equivalents and marketable securities. Okay, so doing the math with that kind of burn rate. Exactly. It suggested a cash runway of uh, less than six months at that point if spending stayed constant and revenue didn't ramp up dramatically or they didn't get more funding. Less than six months. That definitely sounds like they needed to raise cash and probably quickly. How did they address that? I remember a royalty deal. Yes, you're right. Back in late 2023, they secured a big financing deal with Oberlin Capital. It was structured primarily as a royalty financing. How much was that for? They got $210 million up front. That was $200 million tied to future royalties and a smaller $10 million equity piece. The total deal size could potentially reach $320 million. Okay. What triggers the rest? There's another $100 million contingent on that initial FDA approval for Ankitiva and NMIBC, which they've now achieved. Ah, so maybe that extra funding has come in or is coming? Presumably, yes. Yeah. And in return, Oberlin gets tiered single-digit royalty payments on net sales. The rates step up a bit now that Ankitiva is approved for NMIBC. There's also a cap, so Oberlin's total return is limited to 195% of their investment. So basically trading future revenue for cash now, a pretty standard biotech playbook move. Very common, yes. It avoids immediate significant share dilution, though it does mortgage some future profits. Did they do anything more recently? Because that runaway still looked tight, even with the Oberlin money potentially factored in. They did. Just this past April, April 2025, they did an equity financing deal. A direct offering of $75 million. Equity this time. Who was the investor? It was with a single institutional investor, Armistice Capital. And importantly, the deal also included warrants. Warrants, meaning potential for more cash later. Exactly. If those warrants are fully exercised, it could bring in an additional $90 million for Immunity Bio. The goal, they stated, was to fund ongoing operations and keep pushing that pipeline forward. Okay, so they tapped both royalty financing and equity markets. Has they announced any big pharma partnerships for, like, upfront cash or R&D funding this year? Not in terms of direct financial support partnerships announced in 2025, no. They obviously have the strategic collaboration with Beijing for the NSCLC trial. Right, but that doesn't sound like Beijing is just handing them cash. Doesn't appear so, no. It seems more focused on the clinical development side. And they also have the collaboration with the Serum Institute of India, but that's more about product supply and manufacturing not direct funding for operations. Okay, so it really comes down to that revenue growth from ANKTVA and managing the burn rate alongside these financing deals. Which brings us to the big question the listener asked. When might Immunity Bio actually turn profitable? Yeah, that's a million dollar question, maybe billion dollar question here. And honestly, it's really difficult to put a precise date on it. Too many variables, I guess. Exactly. It depends on so many things hitting just right. Continued success in the clinic across multiple indications, getting those regulatory approvals smoothly and on time. How quickly doctors and patients adopt the new treatment. Right. Market adoption is huge. Ugh. And critically, their ability to manage expenses, especially those heavy R&D costs as the pipeline advances. But the trend seems positive with the Ang Ang Tiva launch. The trend is definitely positive. That early revenue growth is encouraging, and the potential from lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, it's substantial. 
It suggests a path towards profitability exists. But it's likely still a few years away. I would think so, yes. Yeah. Given the level of investment still needed for R&D and scaling up commercially for potentially multiple large indications, sustained profitability is probably still several years out. It requires patience and continued execution. So continuous monitoring of their quarterly reports, trial data releases, and regulatory updates is key for anyone following them. Absolutely crucial. Okay, so just to wrap things up, we've got Ankativa showing real promise, starting strong in bladder cancer with significant potential in huge markets like lung and pancreatic cancer down the road. Mm -hmm. A very exciting pipeline, no doubt. But balanced against that, you have the financial reality significant cash burn requiring substantial financing, which they've been tackling through royalty deals and equity raises. Right. It's a really fascinating point for the company. They're at that crossroads of, you know, truly groundbreaking science meeting the tough economics of drug development. A classic biotech story arc in many ways. Exciting yeah. potential, significant hurdles. Oh, could have said it better. Well, for all of you listening, especially those tracking Immunity Bio, hopefully this deep dive gave you some valuable context. If you found this helpful, please do subscribe, give us a like, maybe activate those notifications so you catch our future explorations into biotech and investment opportunities. And perhaps a final thought to leave you with. As you watch Immunity Bio navigate this path, balancing the science and the financials, what specific milestones or indicators will you be focusing on most closely? to gauge their progress towards not just financial sustainability, but ultimately making a real difference for patients. Something to think about.